us, by the way. Oh, they can hear us now? They can. They can hear, they can us, hear right us right now. now. Oh, gosh. They can. They're stop picking kind my of nose. Stare. <laughs> no, stop picking your nose because I'm going to show you in a minute. I did we that on a Zoom call. Can't, well, One of the early Zoom calls. I can't, I can't tell you what Carmen Didi did, but that, which was really funny because I said, we're going live now. And she's like, and then she said something which I had to, I had to delete the whole episode because I couldn't edit it down oh. and, then, and then put it back up. Oh, that's so um, it, it was interesting. So it was, it was just because she does a lot of children's work and children's school. So I was like, well, we can't have that being out there on the public, can we? <laughs> uh, she's brilliant. So Mark. Welcome to Friday with Friends. Here we are. No one's joined us yet, but we're not worried about that because we get at most about five viewers joining us. <laughs> and what happens is, what happens is, is that people watch it at Hello. sensible times when they're free. Oh, we have a viewer. Hurrah. Yay. Hello. <laughs> Hello, viewer. Tell us who you are and where you're from. We would love to know. Um, so, yeah, a lot of people tend to watch later on and, and it'll get up into the, you know, hopefully it'll get up into the 300s. Ooh. I know I'm not a, a YouTube rock star yet, <laughs> but I'm working on it. See, well, they haven't gone away, but they also haven't posted their name yet. That's which okay. Is, which is we okay. respect your privacy, unlike we the do. government or Google <laughs> or Amazon. Yes, that's right. Or Facebook, actually. Yeah, well. Facebook. We gave up our rights to freedom when we signed on with Facebook. That's for sure. So, Mark, you, uh, you uh, all right? So, so people out there, I got to tell you that Mark is probably one of the best um, self promoters that I know. He oh. is. You oh, are, well, look at you. Here I am advertising the Children's Literacy Foundation because I had a gig this morning and the banner was hiding behind me. But like, there's you. You're all set. You've got all of your books because you're a prolific writer. Yes. And you've got your banner behind you that says books and audio. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you're the man. You're you're pretty on the money. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm trying to get better because uh, the people in your audience probably haven't heard of me. So that's the, that's the, the I can be very self-promotional, but if you've never heard of it, uh, eh, you know. It's true. It's true. So Dale, I think, so I thought for a uh, long time. Jenny, Dale, Scott, all these people. I know. So Dale, I thought that you might've been a, uh, a female persuasion and now I think you're male. And now I really don't know at all. Because Dale is a guy's name and a girl's name. But Jenny, there's a picture of her. Oh, yay. UK. Yeah. Open the pond. This is so cool. Oh, Westerns. Jenny. Yay. So i gotta, <laughs> I got to tell you about this. Are I know who Jenny either? is. Yes. Yes. So um, this is so funny. <laughs> Jenny, she's a rock star. Mo Reynolds, she's also a rock star. But i got to tell you about Jenny. Because Jenny is freaking awesome. So I was so Aiden and I, my son and I, my twenty-year-old son and I, we went over to the UK in March. Hey Mo, uh, yeah, Mark's a good guy to know. Um, we went uh, and I, w I went to see Taffy Thomas and interviewed him for my podcast, Conversations with Storytellers. And I wanted to meet up with my dad. My p parents are divorced, and so he was coming from South Wales and I was coming from Worcester. So we kind of met in Hereford, which is kind of a halfway mark. Uh, my brother, my half brother, drove him there, and we we decided to meet at Weston's Cider Mill, mm -hmm. right? Right, Jenny, Cider Mill, right? Not a, not not, a not the other word. Not it's not yeah, it's a mill. Um, and um, I I, I was late because I was just rubbish, and everything was like going up in the air, and so we ended up going on a tour on our own. And Jenny Jenny Peplo was our tour guide, and she was one of the best tour guides I've ever had anywhere. Ooh. Um, right up there with, with a guy that did the tour with me at um, the Mark Twain house year back in the eighties. And he was phenomenal, but the, the, you know, Jenny, so she, we, she's walking us through this cider, cider mill and showing us all these things, but then she would stop. And, and if we appeared interested in something, because it was just us, she would, go into more depth and if if we were kind of started to like okay we're done with this she would wrap up what she was saying and when we go to the next stage she was absolutely phenomenal and then when we were taking photographs of the place she switched the lights around so that things weren't backlit but we, that we actually had light on them so she was she was freaking wow. awesome um hats off to jenny i'm glad that you i don't know how you found me here this is so cool i'm yay i'm all excited she's a great woman lovely woman and then we bought tons of cider <laughs> A lot of it, we ha we could only bring a certain amount back with us. Oh, is, yeah, Mo, Mo put the link up there. That's right. 
And the tour is really well worth doing because the they were starting making cider there before America was, you know, colonized by the Europeans. Oh, and the it's British. a new business. It's a new, yes, it's a new business. It started in the 1700s. It's a reasonably new business. <laughs> One of the things I love about England is the beer. Uh, cider oh, yeah. too, but but um, when I was in college, I spent a semester in London and discovered um, uh, Fuller's ESB. And oh, it's yeah. like yeah. they've been making beer for a hundred years. No, they don't need to do anything differently. Of course, now they do have all these really weird new things that taste like... <clears throat> Motor fluid. Um, I was going to say uh, Budweiser. <laughs> yeah. You know, everybody's big into the IPAs over there too now. Yeah. Um, which is just, don't they realize that the hops was there to kill the bacteria, not for flavoring? Yeah, right. <laughs> so West, I have to say, I'm going to say this, even though Jenny's still listening. So um, actually the stuff that Weston's, um, exports over here is that type of stuff that like you know namby pamby like ooh fruity flavors yes let's all get pop and poppy and all that kind of stuff so yeah that but the yeah, stuff the real they, stuff they keep is, the good stuff at home yeah, yeah well. um, but the vintage stuff was oh my gosh that was so good yeah I, I could have been a viking and, and just lived off that kind of stuff yeah <laughs> for like, sure Vikings did mead <laughs> they did mead a mead oh mead is so strong though we should stop talking about alcohol in case any of our Mormon friends were watching. Oh, sorry, Mo. <laughs> Although it's kind of ironic that Mo has put up that, that westerns-cider.co.uk link. So Mo is a storyteller. I always talk about Mo, so I'm not going to talk about Mo today. But Mo's a really good, she's a really good storyteller. I saw her in Florida. So how are you dealing with COVID, mate? Are you doing all right? I, so I was joking, well... It's been a thing. I mean, it, you know, everybody's got their COVID story. And one of, so I started my life as a writer and I went and became a storyteller. Um, and I've been storytelling professionally for about 20 years. And I've been reviving my writing, um, the writing part of my career. And I was actually in um, uh, England. And then I went to, I, was, I, I had a little European tour. I went to Austria, uh, England, and then Denmark uh, on tour promoting uh, the, the last book called The Misadventures of Rabbi Kibitz and Mrs. Heipool, which is a great Rosh Hashanah gift, by the way. Um, and told you he was good at marketing. <laughs> it's not marketing, it's my life. I, mean, I, spent, I spent, I literally spent, 20 years writing that book in some ways because it was written a long time ago and it got shelved. It was, I took a whole bunch of stories that I wrote and I put them all together into a, a book and I forgot about it. And then a couple summers ago, I, I found this, I'd printed like 20 copies just for the hell of it. And can I say that? Yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, everyone's over 16, right? Okay, good. Yeah. I think. And, that um, <laughs> And I was reading this book and it was cracking me up and it made me cry. And it's like, I wrote it. So I figured other people might enjoy it as well. Anyway, I was in Denmark. I had three gigs in Denmark, one whole, one whole day. To, they were all on the same day, I think. Um, one whole day in a school and then in, maybe it was only two. And then an evening performance at a, a you are a storyteller. You're making it up as you go along. None of this is true. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I did make up some stuff the other day, but um, oh, that's nice. Yeah, it is interesting. So yeah, people are meeting different people in different ways. But I was supposed to be performing in Copenhagen, and this is the real. Uh -oh. All right. So I haven't okay. told this publicly. We got to keep so, our language down because Rachel's, oh no 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 no. Rachel's, so, yeah, just say so. Um, I got to Copenhagen a couple days early and my son Harry's birthday was right around then. And for his birthday, I managed to score us a restaurant reservation at Noma, which is one of the top rated restaurants in the world. Obscenely expensive. <laughs> like, like I, all the money that I made on the tour paid for dinner and not all of it anyway <laughs> so 
it was a we had this wonderful day um ha- hanging out together we walked from uh his apartment which was in the middle of of copenhagen um oh, nice. all the way through the the squat area of copenhagen to this you know walk down this long road to a river and got in the sun's going down and we got there and noma was amazing i mean for that it was like an incredible meal it was a uh I don't know how many courses they would bring it, but all real small stuff and everything was paired with some kind of alcohol and just this amazing meal. It was at a big sort of family style. There were, I think, 20 people at this table, all of us sitting around. There were more staff than there were diners. And at the end of the meal, as we're taking the bus back, I got the message that, they had just shut down the country. Oh, wow. So at least I didn't get it before dinner. Yeah, right. Because <laughs> it would have really sucked. It would have wrecked the dinner. Yeah, you've been um, worrying the whole time, right? Yeah. 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 So well, and Denmark I, is one of the cleanest countries in the world, if not the cleanest country in the world. Well, they were back in school within a few weeks, actually. They they shut it down. They They locked everything down. And then they actually had their kids back in school. They figured it out real fast how to manage it uh, hmm. in a way that, well, most of the countries have just seen. keep banging our heads. Well, we keep ignoring it, actually. But well, yeah, that's not too political today. No, let, no, no. That's one of the rules of this show. We don't get political. And we don't get religious, although we did have so we we got all our religious stuff sorted out before when Mark and I were talking about circumcision. So. Oh yeah, <laughs> there's a good joke. Oh, there's, there's a joke about about a guy that goes into into the hospital, and and I, I'm not going to give you the full joke, but it's it's a, a, a play on words because the the the, the, the surgeon says, "Oh yeah, that, oh sorry, I knew it started with a C." <laughs> Castration being the other word. <laughs> in, in one of my first audio books. <laughs> ooh. Um, in one of my first audio books, the Brothers Shlemiel from Birth to Bar Mitzvah, uh, there's a chapter called Briss. And wise Rabbi Kibitz um, is in his office when Jacob Shlemiel. So the whole, the Brothers Shlemiel is this novel that, I, this, this is how it works. Somebody says something and I go, oh, that. Um the Brothers Shlemiel is a novel about identical twins born in Chelm, which if, you, if you're if you a listener and you don't know what Chelm is, Chelm is a village of fools. Uh, sometimes they're wise, sometimes they're just idiots. And we have, we have Gotham in England. Really? Yeah, yeah. Does that explain Batman and the no, Penguin? I, no, I think it's, I, I don't think they realized. I never heard that. Yeah, Gotham. Yeah, it's, it's, oh. it's where all the idiots in England live, apparently. Okay. Never been there. I should look it up the next time I go over. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway. Um, Sorry. It's okay. We can interrupt each other. You were saying. <laughs> Wait, I got to do this. You were saying. I can't remember what I was saying. You, know, you get on with the story. <laughs> so so uh, Rebecca and Jacob Schlemiel are having kids. And it turns out that they're twins. Uh, one of them was born uh you know, one day and the other was born 12 hours later was a really long second labor. Mm. That that particular detail turned into a plot point. And um, so, uh, you know, the bris in Jewish tradition happens eight days after the birth because, well, they didn't want to name the kids until after they had lived for a few days. Right. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So... Uh, Jacob goes into Rabbi Kibitz and says, Rabbi Kibitz, you know, I've got these identical twins that drive me crazy. Can you do the bris differently so I can tell them apart? <laughs> and <the> Rabbi <laughs> looks at him and goes, you're going to make them drop their pants? <laughs> and he says, no, I can't. You know, when you, a moil, which is what, when you're, when you train to be a moil, the objective is consistency. You know, there's not a lot to work with down there. No, that is really not. <laughs> so he says, but it's permissible for you. In fact, the commandment is for you to do it. And, but you usually delegate it to the moil. If you want to do it. And Jake was like, no. <laughs> so they put an ad in the newspaper 
for another rabbi, but he never shows up. And the rabbi is there and he cuts uh, Abraham's the older. And then he goes to Adam and he goes, oops. And everybody goes, what? He's like, no, I just did it the same. I meant to do it differently. <laughs> so that's my Brit story. You call it a topic. I wrote about it by now. <laughs> it is a little more adult than usual, Rachel's. No, we're gonna. We'll stay. We'll keep it. We'll keep it. We'll keep it family oriented. Rachel, how old one. are your kids? So I mean, let me know about that. So that I. Yeah, we'll keep it family. We'll keep it family. No, seriously, let me know how old they are. Um, and I, uh, so. IKR. Um, what does IKR mean? I'm not very good on these things. I. I can't... know, right? Maybe. Oh, right. Because <laughs> I always think of the word "no" starting with a K. Yeah, maybe I know, right? Um. That makes sense. Hi, Vic. Yeah. So COVID, when I came, I, I, I actually, one of a lot of people were saying, um, why were I, was I worried? Because I actually left England or left the, <laughs> I was in England. Um, I left to go over there and just as it was starting. And people were like, aren't you worried about traveling? And I said, no, because it, it actually hit Rhode Island first. So I figured it's already here. I got nothing to worry about. And I flew over and I did my tour and I came back and then I put a mask on on the airplane from um, in Copenhagen. The airports had hand sanitizers whip tied to every sign. And there was a tape loop. I wish I had everything queued up. Uh, I'd play it for you in Dutch and in English saying, you know, please maintain social distancing. Don't hug and kiss. Um, don't shake hands. Wash your hands frequently. And I got to uh, Gatwick. And Gatwick was like business as usual. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and then well, in, the yeah. Line, in the line to get on the airplane, somebody started coughing. I was like, okay. And I pulled out, I actually had brought a bandana and I put it on and I was the only person on the plane with one. Uh, yeah. We, when we were flying back, it was, it was pretty much the same thing for us. We got the, you know, you must've been in, in Copenhagen when we were in, in, in England mm. because the day that they stopped allowing people into the States was the day that we flew back. Yeah. My son, Harry came back like the same. And both of my kids were abroad, which was why I was one of the reasons why I was going. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. But what we went over, we kind of knew what was going on. Um, we had bandanas, um, but we had like wipes and we had hand sanitizer and I was following Aiden cause I'm very aware of, of what I'm doing with my hands. Um, I don't know why. Um, but I was very, very particular. And Aiden was like walking up the, the stairs at the airport, put his hands on the banister and I grabbed his arm. And my other hand reached into my pocket, pulled out the hand sanitizer and squirted on. I was like, you can't touch anything. And he's like, yeah, 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 yeah. He's 20 for those that don't. Yeah. Know. But yeah, it was, um, it was kind of interesting, the whole experience. And, you know, in the aeroplane, we wiped everything down, like absolutely everything down with wipes and hand sanitizer. And, uh, it, it was, you know, and then on our flight back, right, we, we, we've we been told that it was going to be a pretty empty flight. And I was like, this is great. And, and then in, in the in the waiting area, there's all of these school kids, American school kids. And I'm like, right. right. Like, probably my son might have been on your flight. Oh, maybe. I don't know. But he there was this, they were over there on, probably not because they're over there on a school trip. Oh, okay. And they heard about the lockdown and the, like, everything was closing down anyway. And, and so they, they, they had come from Italy. <laughs> And they were sitting all around us. So Aiden and I were like, we're like sanitizing everything. Like, you know, sitting on the airplane like this. If somebody coughed, we just slid down, slid down further in the seats. It was horrific. Yeah, I paid the uh, uh, aisle seat on the flight from Copenhagen to London. Uh, and then I was lucky because the London plane wasn't, full it was and i had a space between me and then that guy started coughing i was like oh no um yeah i got home and i what i found was that um i've been working out of this lovely studio in the attic for the last year or so and what happened is basically um everybody is hanging out in my home office now all right you know that 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 was the big difference for COVID for me. Aside from all of my gigs getting canceled, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's I think that's the same for all, any performing art. Well, a lot of people, but performing artists, we've been hit hard. You know, you think about like the TV people and the movie movie people. I mean, they make 
they should be making enough money to to not have to worry about this but I, you know the, the electricians that work on those tv shows well, and the lighting people interestingly enough so i have i have uh two of my friends are uh grips and work on films and actually netflix it was keeping them employed they were on full salary uh oh, wow. they're just going back to work actually right now so um it, it's not as bad for them as us who don't have unions. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I'm not sure <laughs> how good our union would be. I remember a song when I was growing up. Um, this is like back in the late '60s, early '70s. But it was "I'm a Union Man." It was a great song. I'll, I'll send it to you. I'm a Union Man. I can't remember the rest of it. I remember it's a really underwear. Yeah, yeah. It was a good, good song. Oh, back in the day when unions were strong and powerful. I have mixed feelings about unions because they've, well, they've, they've done a lot of good, but they've also done a lot of harm to some industries. You know, they, you know, anyway. It's challenging. It uh, is. We said, uh, we said we weren't going to talk about politics. All right, and that's, okay, wait, and that's unions. So <laughs> let's not go down that road. All right, we got unions. We got... <laughs> shh, shh, shh. Yeah. Moyles, we'll, we'll just I talk about... Just is it, all right so this, i pulled i wrote down a few random things um uh -huh. i i got a pair of socks recently like not the 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 ankle i got like sort of they, they now they have socks of all different kinds it used to be that there was just like socks and then they came up with the tube socks right. and now they've got like the little footy socks for men and now they're the ankle socks that come up over the ankles that are sort of halfway between the 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 calf socks and the footy socks and I got this pair of socks from Land's End. Uh -huh. And one of them has the letter L on it. Oh, I think I've got the same pair. Left socks? Did well, I but really they, mean but they, that? But they both have left written on them. <laughs> oh, you went they, to the they... second store. <laughs> Maybe I did. I, I do go to the second store. That's for sure. Yeah, I haven't I haven't bought a full priced shirt in I don't know how long. I never I always buy on sale, but I also, you know, I. Anyway, let's move on. <laughs> but, but, but left socks, and I was like, you know how you lose socks too. I'm sure that yeah. I'm, it was like all of the left socks, and then I'll only have right socks, or actually, because the right ones don't have anything written on. It just says L on one and blank on the other. Maybe that's what I've got. Yeah. Maybe, Maybe I've just put my two L socks together. <laughs> so has anybody else got any sock stories? <laughs> These stories suck. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh. So, so show I, people your, I want, I want people to show your L for what? Land's End. Oh, that makes sense. Oh. Monica, Monica and I used to work together. Well, actually, it's only on one of them. I know. It's really they bizarre. It's a logo You'd on think... one sock. Uh, the name Land's End and L, and the other sock has nothing on it. I, I, I'm wearing them now. I can show you my socks. Yay. And my shorts. I'm wearing shorts. These aren't underpants. Good. <laughs> See, this one here has an L. Oh, those are fancy than mine. Mine are just plain white ones, but it has it has an L at the top along the on the you know the wristband, if you will. Ankle band. Maybe I'm wearing two white socks now. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> this is I'm such a crap conversation. <laughs> Those of you who are looking for depth, I realized something. <laughs> I am not subtle, and you know how you can tell. You know how you could tell if I was being subtle. You can't because it. You just missed it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> See, I'm not subtle at all. I think most of my people know that. It's like yeah. I'm incapable. It's just I say what comes out of my mouth. It's like the lack of filter. So Monica and I, we're used to working in, in this COVID vir virus situation because when I used to work in Portland, Oregon, uh, she, yeah, in Portland, Oregon, she, she would be working in San Antonio. I mean, she always worked in San Antonio, in Texas. Um, I love San Antonio. Yeah, I've, I've not been there yet. I need to go. Oh, I had an amazing experience in 1984. 485 in san antonio texas yeah i i met a guy at a wedding so <laughs> i was temping in new york city in 1984 just graduated from college the goal was to make enough money um to go to england and become a famous playwright 
And in those going to pieces of playwright with other playwrights who are English. <laughs> Nobody had accused me of modesty ever. <laughs> I love it. Chutzpah. Is that the word? <laughs> Chutz, you got to say it like you got something. Stuck. Chutzpah. Sorry. It's, yeah. That's yeah. Okay. I should, I should know. Cause I, I try to speak Welsh sometimes. It's okay. The, um, <laughs> so I was a word processing temp. Uh, back in the days when people had people type stuff for them uh -huh. and uh, word processors were new. And I, I, I'm a computer geek. I'd been programming computers since I was 16. So I knew how to program computers and typing was easy. So I knew all of these word processors and I was getting 18 bucks an hour in 1984, um, which is a ton of money. Yeah, then. yeah it is. So I would work for, I'd work for like two weeks and take a month off. And I was working at L magazine and I met this woman who invited me to her. She liked me. She invited me to her wedding and, uh, the so instructor she didn't like you that much. <laughs> she wasn't married. <laughs> so the instructions were, uh, show up at this street corner at such and such a time and somebody will pick you up. So I, I had my suit and my, you know, backpack. I was going to sleep and sleeping bag. Cause I was going to sleep outside. Um, and because it was an overnight, it was like in uh, on Long Island or something. Hang on, hang on, what? <laughs> okay. <sighs> okay. All right. Okay. The house might burn down while we're on this. <laughs> oh, that would be bad. <laughs> yes, it would. So leave that door open in case I can, so I can smell it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yes, I was serious. <laughs> <clears throat> I believe you. <laughs> I can tell when you're lying. You gotta tell. So, um, so I this this convertible pulls up, and this guy introduces himself as Stephen Stepan. He's from San Antonio, Texas. He's a water planner, and uh, and we hung out. And I it was an amazing wedding. I learned the the one of the guys who was uh, a friend of the groom brought a twenty pound box of garlic because he was going to cook the the meals and he uh -huh. set me to peeling garlic. I learned how to peel garlic really good. Um, I bet if you got five then, cartons of the stuff. Oh yeah. Yeah. It, and it's actually pretty easy once you, anyway. So uh, this guy invited me to come to San Antonio and I got off the plane and he's there. He's like, Hey Mark, I want you to introduce you to my boyfriend, Kyle. And I was like, Oh, well, let me tell you about my girlfriend, Alicia. <laughs> And uh, I spent the next 10 days uh, in the in the San Antonio gay culture, nice. uh, hanging out, going to bars where you had cowboys dancing with cowboys and uh, Fiesta. Oh, they invited me for Fiesta, which is like Mardi Gras. Oh, really? okay. it. It's like yeah. a secret outside of San Antonio, but it's like Mardi Gras, but bigger. Not as long. It doesn't last as long as Mardi Gras, but mm -hmm. it's. I mean, there are so many people. Hmm. So it's crazy. I, I interviewed the Grand Dragon of the Texas Ku Klux Klan on May 1st in front of the Alamo because the Ku Klux Klan was there to protect the Alamo because a few years earlier, a, a bunch of, of people had raised the red flag, the communist flag over the Alamo on May Day. And they were there to defend the Alamo, the Ku Klux Klan in their robes and all. It was really freaky. So that was a really long and interesting week. Yes, it's. Uh, why would you? I'm just curious. Why would you interview the the Grand Dragon? Because he was there, and I was there. I pulled out a notebook and decided what the heck. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I probably do the same thing to be honest, because I have that curiosity as like, you know, why the heck? Yeah. You know what? What you know? I mean, I wouldn't say that because that would probably be a very short interview. But <laughs> what is Worldcom? Oh, so Monica and I used to work for World Worldcom was almost the biggest uh, telecommunications company um, next in the to US. Apple. Well, um, so <laughs> I remember Worldcom. They the, the, like the little you had to punch in like four thousand codes to make a long distance call. Well, you could do. Yeah, you could do. Um, but they, yes, they were, it was a, it was a great company to work for. And then, then the CEO, Bernie, Bernie, San, uh, not Bernie Sanders, 
<laughs> oh, what's his name, Monica? Oh, Bernie, Bernie, Bernie. He kind of went a little bit off the uh, off the rails, and and then it just they people discovered that he was fleecing the company. Um, but yeah, I can't even think of the uh, the other company that WorldCom bought MCI. So WorldCom bought MCI. I remember this. Yeah, and then they then they tried to buy something else, and it was just it was stupid. And and then Bernie got caught out and was thrown in prison along with the the chief financial officer and and, you know, and the and the stock we had enough stocks because they didn't pay you well but they gave you lots of stocks and shares. Bernie Ebers, thank you. Um, they they gave us lots of stocks and we had enough to buy a bed and breakfast. And you didn't at the, cash at out the end of, at the end of it. The stocks were worth toilet paper. Mm. And we did we didn't know enough about the stock market, so we didn't sell. Oh, wow. So we entered to, you know. That's why we're poor. You're asking me about my book. <laughs> Children's Literacy Foundation people. I just want to mention this very quickly. I did a gig for them this morning. Um if you go to cliff onlineorg I think that's what it is. I could have a look. Um they do great work with literature. Uh push them so, over the cliff. sorry? Push them over the cliff. Yes, give them a little push over the cliff. Ah, but yes, um, they do amazing work. They give all these books out, to, brand new books out to kids um, throughout New Hampshire and Vermont. And um, I was doing a, a storytelling thing online. And they were using, the, yeah, a lot of people lost out. So, um, but yes, uh, the the, um, the smart boards. I didn't realize how smart those smart boards are. They are wicked smart, Mark. Yeah. They are. How smart are they, Simon? <laughs> they're smart enough that they have a camera on it so that they can film the classroom. And they have, you can actually, um, it projects onto it so they can have, and you know, like this could be projected on, you know, if, if we if we were doing a kid's show, they could project yeah. this onto the, onto the smart board for the kids and we could see the kids as well. Well, that's kind of cool. Yeah, it is kind of cool. I didn't realize how clever those smart boards, but they are wicked smart. Wicked smart. Wicked smart. Yeah. You sound like a Rhode Islander. <laughs> Wicked smart. I think it's a New England thing, yeah. really. Yeah. Here, so I was on one Facebook group of teachers talking about COVID. And one of the things that came across was there was some teacher somewhere in the US who was told by her administration that she could not address her students by first name because of privacy issues, because they were videotaping the. Wow. That's, yeah, okay. So she was giving them numbers. <laughs> I am not number six. <laughs> Actually, my sister and, um, was it my sister? I can't remember. One of my family members just recently went to Port Ainon, talking of the prisoner. Oh. Port Ainon. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, which is where it was all filmed, where the prisoner was filmed. Yeah. Yeah. And apparently they've they've actually done it all up. And so it's all it looks all brand spanky new again. So um, is it still prisoner esque? Or is it did they like Yeah. No, turn? it's um it was always those the bright colours, it always painted those bright colours and that, that's why they chose that place to to film it. And nobody knew about it until people were like, hang on, that's Port Ionon in Wales. And so and so uh yeah, they uh they um so my my family have recently been there talking to the prisoner <laughs> what's awful monica i don't know what you say the thing about the the giving the kids numbers oh yeah 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 yeah, yeah. those of you who don't know there was an amazing tv show out of the uk called the prisoner that was just a mind blowing experience to watch it really patrick mcnee is that right patrick mcguin McGowan, yes, that's right. Pa Patrick McNee was in the Avengers. Yeah, Patrick McGowan was the prisoner. Yeah. Yes, the, it was sort of the counter culture version. I mean, you know, the Avengers w was was the counter culture, and then the prisoner was like the subversion of the Avengers. It was just yeah. Oh, it was so trippy. It yeah. was yeah. I don't know what they were doing when they were writing that. But they it's one of those things if you commit to been COVID time you commit to something it you can make it work almost always yeah it's true that's true you really dive in so my new book yeah i want people to show, i want people to to see this because so mark has 
Mark has show, has shown me or read bits of this book to me, and it's it's kind of it's it is a cool book, but I had no idea how long it was until yeah. like, he showed it me earlier. Three hundred and what? This is these are small. Uh, Three hundred and uh, da, 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 eighty-seven pages. I mean, That's the text actually point. ends on page. 381 but there's credits and stuff like that mm -hmm. um and it's not it's 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 got really cool book plates in it, it which does. wait I, chapter I can, headings yeah yes um it was it's called the groston rules and it's about these uh seven kids who are uh, going to high school, they're seniors, and they're looking forward to coasting through their final semester. You know how that, you know, they they, they got the grades, they're, they've applied to college, some of them are getting in early, you know, which is making the other ones kind of nuts, because, you know, I don't know what I'm, I'm going to MIT, and the other's like, oh, I haven't heard anywhere. And <laughs> Community college. <laughs> yeah, Spectral State University is where he's thinking he's going, because they got rolling admissions. And... Um, and then in February, uh, during their February, in, if you're in the UK, here in the US, we have this thing called February break, which is like a week long vacation. And during their February break, it's, it's like 55 degrees and it's raining and it rains all week, which is crazy in New England. It rains all week. The dam in Fectville, which is the next town over from Groston, fills up, bursts, blows through the town of Groston, basically wrecking the town of Groston. And the next, that evening, it freezes. The temperature like drops to, you know, 20 below zero. Everything freezes. And the rest of their vacation is spent like gathering firewood and breaking the ice on the toilet. Yeah. And the day before they're supposed to go back to school, you know, the power just went back on and they get texts that say, uh, school's canceled. Uh, we're we, we're going to have to send all of you to Factville. So it was uh, it was written in 2000 and written and set in 2018. It was oddly prescient uh, for kids today. <laughs> so, oh, the the chapter headings. <laughs> This is how it goes. So um, each chapter has a little uh, graphic that goes with it because I was serializing it on Spotify. I like to write oh, serializations. Right. And so January 1st, 2018, I dropped the first installment. It's not, uh, if you look for it, it's still up. It's under the Barkminder project because it's full of expletives. And the title was actually is not- Is that the same as an expletive? Yes, I believe. Is that how you say it? Expletives? Yes. Expletives, yeah. I guess that with that final E at the end, that would kind of make sense. Expletive, right? Anyway, um, so Spotify, <laughs> uh, when, you, when you do something on Spotify, it, it, you have to have a, a, a little cover, a little graphic to go with it. And I was writing a chapter a week and I had to come up with this chapter covers for each week. And I, I did the Spotify serial for about, I think, 17 weeks maybe. And then I got a little bit, nobody was listening at the time. So I figured, oh, forget it. And he kept writing the book, but I kept doing the chapter covers because I really liked them. And it was a neat challenge. So you made those yourself? Yeah. 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 Oh, cool. I, it, uh, they just changed this. So it used to be until like last week, you could do a Google search and it would tell you, uh, it would search through things and you could say, um, thank you. Thanks. Fire <laughs> <laughs> is saying that I'm messing with you. I'm not. That's how we say it over in the UK. Uh, from your part of the UK, maybe they do. <laughs> but in my true. part of the UK, we talk like this. Um, <laughs> Actually, so, we talk where I come from. They talk a little bit like this. So it's expletives. Oh, in your Liverpool, very tight. No, no, that's Birmingham. No, Liverpool's. It's a lot more clippy and up, up, upbeat oh, than Birmingham. Yeah, yeah, it's very different. That's that was a horrible Liverpool Indian accent. But yeah, <laughs> everyone's agreeing with you. They're saying that it, I'm just making it up. I don't think I am. It's how I pronounce it. Then. <laughs> <laughs> Are we allowed so, to stick our tongues during COVID? <laughs> 
As long as I don't spit on you, and I think it'll be all right because the screen will protect you. Yeah. Supermarket. And there's a little kid, like, go, you know, I was pushing the shopping cart, and there's a little kid. And usually, when the kids are like, my my response is, I make a face and I smile at them or I stick out my tongue, but I can't do that anymore. Anyway, no, that's true. So yeah, there's a lot of there's 40, 40 book plates. That's a lot. And so, do you, are they drawings? Because I haven't seen the book. No, no. So what happened is. Um, the I would do a search. I, I'd sort of come up with an idea. I'd do a search on Google. I'd look in Google Images, and you used to be able to say um, reuse, you know, for any purpose, and it would take out all the ones that were required royalties. Mm -hmm. so I found the ones that were Creative Commons zero uh, or stuff, and now they just changed that, so it's actually much harder to do what I've been doing for the last year to find that one that you can have all the rights to. Um, but I do have credits for all of them in the back of the book, just because I thought that was a good thing. You know, there's a, there's. You Sorry, you don't have to show it to us. We trust I'm you. the credits of the book. <laughs> I'm selling this book like crazy today. Um, How many books have you written? I don't know. Um, all, so I, all those books behind you. Yeah. They're all books, right? They're not like. Well, there's some not... CDs. There's some okay. audio books. Yeah. Are there any VHS tapes there that are just pretending no, to be no. books? <laughs> I did not make any V I had I did not no. There's, there's some videotapes of live performances back in the day that I have a VHS of a show called Your Mother Wears Liberace's Army Boots. Um I've seen right. the book, yeah. Um, which I, I I just dug up that clip. There's I so I ran a theater for a couple of years in Providence. It was called the Real Fun Theater Company. And every show, we did a whole season. I mean, I on zero money, I did eight shows. And um, each show would start with uh, a serialization that I wrote because I figured if I write a serial, then people want to come back and find out what happens next. And then That's five a theory. <laughs> it was fun to do. It's the real fun theater company, right? It's like, yeah. And and we open and see. I'm a serial. I know what serials do, which is you open and you tell people what they missed, right? Mm -hmm. Leave them cold. So, um, so it was that plus five minutes of Shakespeare. I went to the Trinity Rep Conservatory in Providence, and we did Shakespeare scenes. And there, and I graduated, and then I got in touch with the the school, and I got their students to come and do their scenes at the beginning of the show. That's cool. Wasn't it? Yeah. And and so and then and then the show, whatever it was. And we did a whole bunch of things. And the last show was uh Your Mother Wears Liberace's Army Boots, which I wrote and directed and had a bit part in. And uh the finale of the show, my upstairs neighbor uh looked like like looks like Chuck Norris. Really? Yes. And he had studied <laughs> stage combat. We had in oh, Rhode really? Island guys who choreographed the fight scenes for um, what the heck, what is it called? This, the movie Romancing the Stone. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. With Michael Douglas and Kathleen Turner. Turner. I was and mad crush on her when that movie came out. Everybody did. Um, <laughs> and these guys had a thing called the fair, which was a Renaissance fair. And they basically, they taught stage combat for nine months. And then they put everybody into this amazing show with fight scenes for the summer. And I had three guys who knew, uh, four, three guys and a woman who all were trained in stage combat and I knew Aikido. And so the climax of the play was the last 10 minutes of Hamlet with Chuck Norris as Hamlet. It was the comedy of Hamlet. <laughs> It was the funniest thing ever. It was so funny. And it's on YouTube. Oh, it is? It is. Find the link and put it in. Uh, send it uh, to me in, our, in the I, chat and I'll put it up there because that would be that would be fun. I'd like people oh, to see I it because that looks you, good. you want me to type? Well, I, I, I just... Uh, all right. Facebook. I just... Wait a second. Here we go. It's called... I guess I could find it. Hang on. Uh, That's so cool. I, I love those things. There's also the five-minute... Um, Shakespeare Company, and that's a riot. All right, I, uh, they do their I stuff. Send it to you, private chat. Boom, there it is. I see it. 
All right, folks. I, can't I did it that fast. I must be getting good with the computers now. I, I know. I think we all are at some point or another. Well, that used to be my edge. Oops. <laughs> that used to be your edge? Yes. When I oh, started. Cause it, yeah, because you were doing all that, all that computing. Yeah. 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 That, you, so why did you give that up? If you don't mind me asking. Storytelling? I mean, that, no, the, <coughs> no, the coding. Because that's, like, that's a good gig. Um, <clears throat> I, I started programming computers in 1976. And, um, wow. Yeah. That is early. I know. Uh, the first, so, I mean, the old days we used to have these, um, uh, little things that looked like typewriters that had thermal paper and you, and you would plug a phone into the back of them. And that I was I was on the internet in 1975 or 76 with DARPA net. Um, our high school had computers. How old that, are you? I thought that we were the same age, but my birthday, obviously not. <laughs> my birthday was uh, was two days ago, so uh, I'm well, older. Belated now. happy birthday! Thank you. Um, the 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 computers at our school when we first freshman year uh they had teletype machines that connected to a time sharing server and in order to save your program you typed it in and it came out with paper punch tape that you would yeah. have to then feed back in uh by the senior year we had floppy the big floppy disks that were right. like that big and um the thing was is that the kids who were two years younger than me uh -huh. all got the Radio Shack TRS-80s. Right. And they learned how to code machine language. Oh, I mean, right. I knew basic and all this other stuff. I realized I, I, I did computers through college. I was at Columbia and I was taking the courses and I signed up for this course called Applied Combinatorics. That was like the key course. You couldn't get through the whole thing without taking this course. What the hell is it? I'd been programming for years. I was making money. I was working for, um, I got, uh, I, I, I got fired. The FBI investigated me for computer hacking at NIH at one point. Good for you, mate. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, uh, nice one. Yeah. And so um, the, uh, I, I took this course cause I didn't know what it was. And it, it made no sense to me. It was all about taking huge stacks of numbers and um, yeah, exactly. Hole punch paper. It yeah. was horrible. And cause they would tear, they wouldn't go in right. It didn't really work. Not a great medium, cheap, but um, anyway, it turns out that applied combinatorics is when you take a huge bunch of numbers, you put it through a very small pipeline and you bring them out on the other side, which if you think about that, is called the internet. Yeah. So yeah. they were actually on the right path. And I, that's when I said, I do, a, I, I did a program uh, called Eureka about math anxiety. And one of the things that I learned when I was studying math anxiety was most people have math anxiety because at some point in their life, they go either I'm stupid, this is dumb, or I don't get this or I'll never need this. And that's when they stop learning math. Yeah. I went through three of those. I'm yeah. stupid. I don't get it. I'll never need it. Right. And, th and then that's the level at which you stop learning math or pretty much anything. And right. that was, same that with art, right? That's why everybody draws like a five-year-old because that's when they stop doing art. Right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, and that's pretty much when I said, you know, I don't need this. And I also had this, feeling that I would end up becoming a manager and I didn't want to do that. I don't know. And I got into writing. I met this girl and she was always drawing. I couldn't draw because I can't draw. Uh, so I started writing and then she dumped me and I had something to write about. <laughs> and that started your writing career. That was the start of my writing career. Oh, there you go. Who knew? Who knew, Who knew that it was a dump? I it, should, was. Uh, it was being dumped. It was being dumped by, by a girl. Ah, it was hard. That happens to all of us at some point. And it happened um, again and again and again. I know. <laughs> oh, poor some me. Some of us more than others. That's for, that's for sure. But you know what? When I tell that story in elementary schools, they all look at me like. 
Yeah, we don't care. <laughs> <laughs> so you got to change it to their perspective. You got to say that this was my best friend ever, and then they totally get it, and they, they and they went away and they never came back, and I was so upset. And then yeah, they'd understand. Then they'd know, understand. I it. don't mind lying to them in my stories and in my fiction, but I kind of feel like I should tell the truth when they ask a question like that. But you are t you're telling the truth in uh, in a way that you they understand. My best friend, I just. Yes, but you don't have to. They don't need to know that stuff. <laughs> she was your best friend at that oh, particular time. Oh, she, she wasn't. Tell me if she was my best friend. Well, she she might have been your best friend, but you weren't hers. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't laugh. That's very sad, Mark. It was. It was so sad. <laughs> I know. My first breakup was a mess, uh, but I'm not going to get into that. Okay. Her name was Nicole. She had a uh, brother called Greg. That's as far as, and a sister, but I can't remember her name, but that's as far as I'm going to go. You know, what was, was funny, um, or I don't know if it's funny, F funny peculiar. I was back, I was back in England at, at some point and I was running through, I grew up in Worcester and I was running through this city center to meet up with a friend. And there's this, there's this woman pushing this push chair and with a baby in it. And I'm like, Aah! I was like, that's Nicole. And it was this it was it was this woman that I was my first love, and I was like I did a double take, and I was like Nicole, and she's like Simon, I was like yeah, and uh, she's what are you doing? I was like well I'm living in America now, but I, I'm on my way to meet Billy, who is my best mate, right? He still is my best mate, and uh, you know I was like good to see you, <laughs> and off I went. So it was kind of like oh okay, that's that's how that ended, uh, but it was interesting. It was interesting to see her, and like you know, the fact that I felt so attached to her at the time and how yeah. gutted I was when we broke up and then seeing her and it was kind of like nothing, you know, it was just like, wow, that's an old acquaintance of mine. It was really bizarre. I don't, you know, it's, I mean, I, I've, there have been relationships where I've got, I've seen people and I've been like, Oh my gosh, oh, it's, it's so <laughs> why? But then I was, and then there's the ones where you're like, Oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> Dodged a board on that one. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. I've never done that. But anyway. <laughs> or if I did, I'd never say so. <laughs> so what are you working on now? What are you doing right now? Well, right now, I'm actually recording the audio book for the Groston Rules. That's mm -hmm. my big... Well, I'm writing a play, too. And I wrote a short story last week. I'm writing another one next week. But... Hang on. Whoa, 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 whoa. You wrote one last week and you're going to write one next week. How can you say that you're going to write one next week? Because I know what I'm going to write. I There's a contest. So the Providence Journal has a fiction contest. And it's like, okay, I got to enter that. And they want a story set in COVID, which I haven't written yet. So I'm going to write it on Monday. Do you know what the premise of the story is? Well, I know how it begins. Okay. But then you're just going to let it come out? That's how I work. Um, there's a wonderful book called Impro by Keith Johnstone, who was the playwright at the King's something theater in London. And he actually founded the English improvisation movement, which was dis different from the Chicago movement. And there's an amazing book called Impro, which when I was living there that, uh, after I, after I made the money from the temping uh, i moved there and i was working at the notting hill gate theater and i met oh, nice yeah yeah um and i met this guy named tex who gave me this book and i began and i read the book and it's an amazing really thin book brilliant teaching about how to imp improvise writing and i've been doing that for the last you know four thousand years basically <laughs> and you get pretty good at it after a while yeah so it's sort of like, which is why I love serializing things because I, I, I'm, perf I'm really performing a novel in some right. sense. Um, That's how Dickens know. used to do it. And, uh, right. and, and Twain, didn't Mark Twain also do this? I don't know if Twain did. Um, I know Dostoevsky did. Uh, right. And I know that both Dickens and Dostoevsky got, got paid by the word. So wow. that's one of the reasons why those descriptions are so long. Seriously. <laughs> totally. <laughs> That they, makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, they got paid <laughs> by the word. And um, so 
so I'm recording the audio. Well, so I'm going to write this thing on on Monday, uh, and but I'm recording the audio book to the Groston Rules, uh, which is my new book coming out in November, and the it's totally different experience from. I mean, I did the the serialization recordings because it's all our you know the first bunch of episodes are the early, first draft really are on Spotify. But it's been rewritten a, a hundred times since then. Uh, and I was recording those as I went along. So every week I would record the installment. Now I'm doing a, a 381 page book. Oh my. And, you know, the long, I have lots of, you know, albums, CDs, which I call audiobooks now. Um, and, and I've done those in studios where I go in and I do you know, three hours of talking and it becomes a one hour CD. Right. Uh, but this is, you know, I was, I was in the basement uh, two and a half hours this morning and I got uh, three chapters done. Nice. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a lot of, it's a lot of fun. It's, but I got to say, if you're, if you're going to release the book in November, doing the, waiting to do the audio book until September, <laughs> September. Is a bad idea because I find yes. mistakes. <laughs> You know, yeah. I, go, I go, that doesn't make sense. Or I go, ooh, it would be better if I switch these words around and I make a little note on the PDF and then I have to go back and, and I put it back into the, the text file and then I put it into, because the ebook is so complex because it's got all these illustrations and, oh, ah, my wife is bringing me an espresso. Nice. Yeah. Let's, I want to see your wife. I saw a picture. Of, hang on. This is my Come friend, on. Simon. Hi, Simon. Hey, how you doing? It's Hello. nice to meet you. She's, a, nice to meet you she, she's an Heather. amazing ceramic artist. She made this little mug. This little one. Well, nice. Yeah, that's in this, it's a homemade. That's display. beautiful. Oh, no. Where's that? Is made. it? We're that's up here, right? Yeah. This is the yeah. thing. Yeah. Uh, it's a little too blurry. I can, I can, I can figure out what it is though. That's beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, she just really nice. Before. Bye. I use this one because I stole it. <laughs> I did. I ripped it off from a restaurant. Um, I, I, yes. My favorite espresso mugs are stolen. So thanks, Heather. Um, so, yeah. I don't know. I get told of a potential fire in the house and you get espresso. <laughs> That's the difference between Rhode Island and New Hampshire. <laughs> it is. We have bears and foxes and stuff, too, oh, running hey, through our front yard. I, yeah. I did want to pass this on to... I was about this one of the reasons i so i lost a bunch of weight over the last few years and some of it was cutting carbs mm -hmm. but uh one of the things that i think really what made the biggest difference and i didn't know this until months later which was around the same time we went to italy and in italy uh the american coffee stinks and they have these these espressos are everywhere and they cost a euro oh wow yes it's a euro and and if you want it to go, it costs more because they have to put it in a paper cup and they charge you for the cup. Nice. Which I like. Yes. You know? But if you go to the counter and you order an espresso, it's a euro. And that's what I started drinking. And I loved it. And, you know, I'd get two in the morning and I'd get one later. And so when I came back, we ha we had an espresso machine, but it was it was such a pain to make. But I decided I was done with the coffee maker, and and I put it away, and I stopped, and I just make myself espresso in the morning. But I used to drink uh, a pot of coffee pretty much every morning, like a full wow. big pot of coffee, and just think about the volume of that in your stomach. It's like it made my stomach bigger and needed more food to fill. Anyway, yeah. And the acid from the coffee. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So we've got helpful tips. We've got socks. <laughs> what haven't we covered? Let's. <laughs> what haven't we covered? Well, here. All right. So here, this is. The <laughs> I was thinking about how fortunate you and I are. Incredibly yes. fortunate to have the lives that we live. But one of the measures that nobody thinks about is how many things do you have in your house that you can cook food with? You know, so, people yeah. of previous lives, you know, we have fire. 
Oh yes, man, yes. fire to cook with, and that's yeah. it. You know, fire. If fire go out, big problem. Yeah. Um, because they all sounded like that. <laughs> I oh, so uh, on the other list, the disaster. So one of my first <laughs> summer doing storytelling. You know how the libraries have these horrible themes every summer for yes. for yes. library themes. Well, the first year I was doing storytelling in libraries, the theme was famous firsts. So yeah. Let's, let's have that's our theme for the summer. So I was like, famous oh, I'll come up with some stories. And I came up with like, who is the first toothbrush? Um, and and then I came, I thought, well, who was the first person to tell a story? And of course, it's Og Caveman, huh? <laughs> Og, Og live in cave, huh? With, with dog woof, and wife, Marsha. Hi, I'm Marsha. <laughs> I told this story in Chelmsford, which is where I used to live. I had moved out. I was living in Providence. I'd come back to Chelmsford. The librarian had changed. The real librarian wasn't there, but there was a volunteer there that day. And this volunteer had a be up her bonnet about my stories. That my story called The Little Girl Who Loved Sugar. At the end of the story, the girl shouldn't like sugar anymore. And my Og story, she wrote me a three-page letter and in this letter, she explained that Og was offensive. Because it was offensive to cavemen. Wow. I never worked in Chelmsford again. You should go back there. I tell should. The, I don't think tell like, the same stories. I should. Like this is this is the set that got banned in Chelmsford. That's that's how you should advertise it. Banned, you should do a show banned in Chelmsford. <laughs> well, those stories are on my Transmit Joy audio storybook, which is available on iTunes, Amazon, Audible. I don't know if it's on Audible. Spotify. If it's on Amazon, it'll be on Audible. Presumably. No, 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 no. I sneak into Amazon through CD Baby. Oh, you do? Yeah. I get in, I have Audible too, but my I, I have a call into my distributor because it's not working right. Anyway. Um, Everything's going to pieces at cd baby right now is it they, yeah they've been bought out again and it's it's a bit in there oh they go uh, through some changes and i i filled in a survey and i was i was pretty honest about how i felt because you know why not be and i got this lovely email from the ceo apparently <laughs> saying well actually we're not forgotten about the little guy most of our people are little guys and this is what we're doing now instead and you know oh so send it on to me i'm curious i will yeah, I. Those of you who are out there, uh, if you do want to buy my books and stuff, a lot of them are for sale on the website. If you go there, you can pre-order the Gross and Rules, and you'll get an autographed version. The uh, would that be this website, Mark? That would be markbinder.com, or the new one is called markbinderbooks.com. That's my new branding. Uh, I'm like <laughs> at markbinderbooks everywhere now. Um, <laughs> Transmit Joy will get you there too. Uh, and it all goes to the same place. But one of the challenges that I feel as a human being and as a writer especially is I didn't get into writing to work for Amazon.com. Right, yeah. And it's really annoying. So the ebook, by the way, if you buy the ebook and you don't want to get it from me, uh, get it on Google Play Books. Uh, you can't put the – the problem is, of course, you can't put it on your Kindle. Uh but Google Play Books is a really good platform for books and audiobooks, especially because the percentage that goes to the artist is higher. And for example, um, Amazon just char Amazon charges me extra because of all the illustrations in the book to distribute it. They charge me a dollar forty to send out an ebook to people. Wow. Yeah. Bad Amazon. Yeah, Don't I'm, I've, I've, when Amazon first started, we thought it was great. And I, I yeah. in the last couple of years, I've thought the complete opposite of that with Amazon. Well, it's brilliant. It's subversive. It's destroying our, I mean, the ability of human beings to have interactions and make stuff and connect with people. Yeah, I do. So I do some money, not lots. Monica, I do make some money, but I don't make a lot of it. They make right. They make more money than I do. 
Right. On on his work, which is ridiculous. Yeah. And Especially it's the same the, with a lot of their stuff. The audio it's, audible.com the the uh if you if you're independent and you put your actually any of the audible.com stuff um amazon takes between they take 60 percent just for for owning audible um, right. well yeah audible is amazon right yes yeah i mean that's the whole thing it's it's crazy so i i've stopped buying things from amazon i'll actually use you know you know how we use how, how we used to do things is like we we'd look things up in a bookstore or something like that. And then we think, oh, I can get it cheaper on Amazon. We go and buy it on Amazon, right? And now it's like, I look things up on Amazon and then I go and buy it locally. Yeah. So I've completely switched it around. I'll, you know, because I, I like, I'd rather give the guy, I'd rather give our guy, Chris Minor in at Morgan Hill Books in town. I'd rather give him my money because yeah. his kids go to the same schools that my kids go to. Well, not my son because he's in college, but and you know he's investing in our town so i want to invest in him and not in amazon when he stays and, and i don't need to buy the owner of amazon whatever his name is like a new car or a new house or a new yacht right it's like a that's or a toothpick yeah for like solid gold costs yeah. four million dollars it's like I, why would i do that why would i give my money to a huge corporation that does nothing for my community if i can buy locally and and give back to the people that work around me and it's, that's 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 the way i work it's it's now. challenging because at the same time the technology mm -hmm. you know i've got 24 25 books and audiobooks and my local bookstore can't carry them all or or right. they could yeah. but, but i don't sell enough or justify it enough for them to do it because whatever but um right. you know when when terry pratchett's last book came out the shepherd's crown mm-hmm uh, I still haven't read that yet. I gotta read. It's that. really good, actually. Uh, it's better than the one before that. The, uh, Terry Pratchett, for those of you who don't know, wrote an amazing series of books called Discworld, and the best of them, I think, is Night Watch. That's one of my favorites. They're actually making it into a series. Uh, there's a BBC series that's coming out shortly. But anyway, um, Terry Pratchett, best-selling author, like millions and millions of copies, hardcover book. He died. He had uh, Hutchinson's or Parkinson's. I think he had Parkinson's. Yeah, Hutchin I think it's Hutchinson's. He, he actually, actually killed himself. Um, and he actually, his last tweet was the end. <laughs> nice. Seriously. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah. That's Terry Pratchett for you. It was. And his, his last book came out uh, about a year after he passed. And if there was one book that every Terry Pratchett fan would pay full price for, it was that one. But... On Amazon, you could buy it for like twenty bucks, as opposed to twenty. You know, you could you like it was it was so discounted on Amazon, so that the bookstores that would have sold it for full price because people would have come in and paid it. I would have, yeah, yeah. Evil, evil, evil corporation. All right. Well, my wife came down and she was trying to tell me something, and I I was very good at like, no, I'm on my show right now. Come and talk to me later. Um, so I should probably go. It's also we've gone for an hour and eight minutes according oh. to the counter. You're you you you're like a, a you're like two minutes ahead of me over there in New Hampshire. So it's, it's three oh seven here in Rhode Island. Well, that's what well my on my computer it says three oh seven, but the clock says well maybe that was the two minutes at the beginning. Oh, when we weren't doing anything, that might have been it. Anyway, well, everyone, Mark, thanks for being here. Everyone else, thank you so much for being with us. And I hope you've enjoyed something. I, I hope you've um, had a bit of a giggle, that we've put a smile on your face as well as our own faces. Um, I hope you look up Mark at markbinder.com. He has half a million books, if not more. Um, so buy one of them because, you know, both both he and his wife are artists, so you know they're not they're not rich, <laughs> and the house hasn't caught fire no because I'm still here. Yeah, you would well, have seen it would have looked like Portland at some point, and I would have had to be like, I'll, I'll be right back, Mark. <laughs> Can you tell a story? <laughs> so I think we're safe. We're all good. So thanks for being here, everyone, and I'll see you next week when my guest will 